fact that there will be nodes uh, being elected for retrieving information and sort of arriving to a common response to a their request in the form of voting what is the result. Um, that's also that we are also doing it using a proof of stake mechanism that is a bit more nuanced. And because of the nature of our network and the fact that it's it's an oracle and all that matters there is data integrity. Um, there, that's that's what um, what we really want to uh, heavily test on a testnet environment. That's why. In the coming months, we will be running probably multiple test nets where we try to break the thing essentially, and and that's if if I were an attacker, if I have to put on on an attacker mindset, which is what we will need to do for that stage or that phase, um, that will take trying to essentially um, monopolize witnessing committees, which is uh, when you have an Oracle query, a data request, th and you say, I want these to be resolved by 10 or 50 nodes, whatever, in the witness network that will be randomly sampled and secretly sampled. Uh, monopolizing a witnessing committee means that some player or, uh, um, or, or multiple players colluding will uh, whether they will be able to tamper with the result of a oracle query by forcing themselves into being a majority in that committee that's essentially the main attack that one can imagine on a on a, on a system like witness so that's uh that's something that um we have included um a number of countermeasures against there were countermeasures against that in the in the former protocol, the one that is running right now, uh, with the with the reputation and all that stuff. But uh, the security uh, characteristics of 2.0 are quite uh, stronger to that sense, mainly in the form of the coinage resets, which guarantee that the the um, the attack that you are. Um, explaining here in which someone tries to accumulate coin age that they have a lot of power and they give they can force themselves into joining a certain data request uh, into joining uh, one witnessing committee or whatever is not feasible uh, because in the end uh, if you are trying to tamper with a particular data request the most uh, you can do is essentially take one place in the committee not multiple because the, in the incentives are there for, uh, join, for joining all your stake in a single identity. So essentially to put all your stake in a single node, this is something that we will probably see asked after and, and I can explain in more detail, I can elaborate more. Um, but, but essentially um, this, this um, attack that is said here in which, oh, I want to, I, keep, I, I will refrain from proposing blocks and just accumulate coinage uh, that will multiply my stake and that will become like my network power and I will um, accumulate that and leverage it in the future to tamper with the content of some block that's that's not even that's that's simply not not there, there's no incentive in doing that because this is a blockchain and it's a property of any um, of any public blockchain that even if you can force you force like if, even if you can uh, force the network to acknowledge that you are the one and only miner for this network epoch there's like you cannot really mine a block that contains fake transactions you can mine a block that contains only your transactions or you can mine a block in which you decide to censor other people's transactions and you can mine a block in which there are no transactions. Those are the three things that you can do if you, um, if you are, if you, in, if in some way uh, you are able to force yourself to be the miner for a particular epoch in any public blockchain. But then the thing that happens with the coinage resets is that at this, in the same moment in which you force yourself into mining a block, 
and whatever you do with that block that doesn't really matter the next epoch you will have zero power because you used all your power in proposing your block and in getting your block accepted by the network so at the end uh, in the next epoch you cannot continue with the with the attack unless you have more than half of the proof uh, half of the stake in the in the network but that's obviously um, one property of proof of stake and um, and the thing is that the Winnet protocol has always been designed around that fact that at any time a big attacker could censor blocks, could uh, force the network uh, not to have a block in a particular epoch or to block uh, or to mine a, an empty block. And um, and and you know the way that um, the life cycle of data requests works with several commitment rounds and rebuild rounds and uh, with co uh, with uh, compulsory tallies um, essentially prevent that from happening because even if there's a big attacker who will try to censor the rebuild transactions for example in the next block there will be someone else come in and uh, including the missing rebuilds and nothing happened Sorry for the for the <laughs> for the long uh, response, but it was a, a long answer as well. A long a long question, sorry. Yes, yes. Um, thank you for that answer. <clears throat> I, I assume um, a lot of the community is very happy uh, to hear that um, these things are being thought of because uh, that's really important when it comes to something like this. So I appreciate that long answer. Um, and I did actually start uh, a recording about a quarter of the way through, so hopefully got most of that. Um, but let's move on now to question two. Uh, will there be some kind of nodes or super nodes where you stack more or less wits for getting better rewards? Yeah, th there you go. <laughs> I saw that coming. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, uh, because because the protocol, uh, because the, because the proof of stake algorithm that we are implementing is mostly uh, linear, which means that um, the the likelihood. Uh, to be eligible to mine a block and essentially your expectation of uh, getting mining block uh, rewards, block mining rewards, is proportional to the amount that you stake and how long it's been staked. Um, that's what we call power, which is just the, the product of stake and time. Um, there, there's no, there's no um, theoretical advantage in splitting your coins among multiple nodes because uh, if you have thousand coins and you stake them into different nodes you have 500 and 500 and then you multiply by the time but the, the total amount of power will be uh, exactly the same as if you stake that into a single node I think this is something that everyone can understand then in practice of course uh, we will um, document all of these that essentially there's the recommendation of split actually splitting your stake into capital like two or three uh, different nodes maybe in some different VPS providers or whatever uh, just not to put all you know, all the eggs on the same basket essentially because if you are uh, when, when you are validating blocks in a proof of stake um, mechanism uh, network there will be slashing if uh, you if your node becomes unavailable or if it's uh, not performing as expected. So um, it's always a good idea to limit the risk of losing your part of your stake by but by uh, simply splitting that into a couple of nodes and then if one fails, uh, you are essentially limiting. Uh, the amount that you will be slashed for. But the, uh, at, at the end of the day, no, there are no like super nodes um, or any kind of super lin linearity or exponential rewards for um, for staking more. So essentially, if you stake twice the amount, you uh, you can expect to get twice the rewards. Beautiful, thank you. 
I think that's a simple enough answer um, for that question. So question three, minimum or maximum stake amount? I think a lot of people are excited to hear the answer on this, and it's uh, pretty straightforward from what I remember. So this is something that has been <coughs> discussed in length uh, in the Discord server. Uh, sadly enough, the conversations are lost because of the, of the Discord hack uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, but um, essentially, there, there, there are very valid arguments against and for having minimum or maximum stake amounts. And the agreement that we reached is that we didn't need to have a big minimum, um, a big ask for the minimum. And the only reason to decide to have a minimum is to prevent uh, essentially spamming and keeping the data structures that the staking system needs uh, in, in a size that works uh, in memory and that doesn't change the requirements, the hardware requirements for running a node. So the minimum that we are working with right now, the, the value that is on the table right now, it's uh, 10K width, uh, 10,000 width, which is roughly like 50 bucks. Um, so it's uh, pretty affordable. Um, and from that amount on, it's it's uh, it's completely linear, so you can stake whatever amount you decide. Great um, data than, than that. Then for the for the maximum, um, there are, there are uh, clear references of systems that have a maximum stake amount. Uh, main one being Ethereum, where you you need to stake. 32 ETH, that's the minimum and the maximum, if you are uh, running a validator. Uh, if you are staking in, in an exchange, you can do whatever, uh, <coughs> because you are essentially lending them the coins for them to stake. That's, um, if you, uh, if we look at what's happening in Ethereum, there's a heated debate, debate about exactly this, because um, they, 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 they put the minimum to prevent spamming, spamming and uh, not to have uh, big data structures as I explained, but then they introduce a maximum, which essentially does the same. Uh, when you have a, a maximum, um, as people have more coins than the maximum that they want to stake, because if you want to stake, for example, 100 ETH and the minimum and maximum is 32, you need to run three validators, right? So what happens is that the network ends up having a census of validators that doesn't really represent the amount of independent node operators that they're in that there are in the network. Uh, it, it gives a false sense of decentralization, and it forces the system to have a very lengthy list of different uh, validator addresses and to keep track of their stake, their slashing, and so on. And that's very, uh, that's rather costly uh, to compute in every single block. Um, and it's very spammy. So they are considering removing that maximum or changing to a different model uh, to get rid of, of this stuff that is actually precluding very nice features for uh, future upgrades of the Ethereum protocol that are not feasible with uh, that maximum in place. So we have learned that, that lesson and we have uh, essentially run away from setting any maximum. There's one maximum in practice which is only because of uh, mathematical reasons and <coughs> computer science reasons, but that amount is uh, probably way above the total supply of bitcoins. So uh, in practice, um, the limit exists, but at the same time, nobody will hit it. <laughs> yeah, Doctor Spiu uh, left some comments in the in the chat with more color on what's happening on Ethereum around this discussion, which is very interesting. Awesome. Thank you for that one. Um, <clears throat> all right. Next up, will there be a queuing mechanism to stake like in Ethereum? This is a great question. Very excited when I saw this one. So um, 
right now in the uh, let's say the MVP for the proof of stake um, algorithm, there's no queuing mechanism per se, uh, one that schedules the um, or, or limits the the rate in which new stakes can create it and, and how new stakes are prioritized and so on. But uh, because of how block space works in WebNet, uh, <coughs> there's um, there's an organic queuing mechanism, let's say, in the sense that uh, when you want to stake, you will need to issue a stake transaction that will remove balance from your wallet and that will deposit that amount of stake to your node, to your validator node. So those transactions uh, need to be signed by your wallet, they will go onto the mental and there they will be prioritized based on fees and uh, there's a limit of the amount of stake transactions that can go into a single block. So we can we can essentially expect during the phase in which 2.0 is not yet active but it's already locked in by the DAPI mechanism during that month at, at the least it will last a month and during that mon month people will be able to start uh, staking and issuing stake transactions which will become allowed by the network at that point before uh, proof of stake enters into force um the, uh, you can expect that in the early days of that period or maybe in the late days of that period uh, there, uh, there will be a lot of people staking at the same time and transactions staking transactions may pile up in the in the mental and may get prioritized by fees so essentially whoever is willing to pay more fees to the miners, they will be able to confirm their staked coins sooner. That will not give them any advantage at all. That will not give them any um, coin initial coinage because everyone will begin with the same coinage. Um, so it's, it's only a practic practical thing um, and shouldn't affect much. Then once uh, the the 2.0 thing is running and proof of stake is running, uh, there's the, the same mechanism will uh, will still work for prioritizing the staking transactions. Uh, but but there's an ongoing discussion on whether to implement mm, fancier um, mechanisms for taking and 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 staking. Um, and there are significant um, points regarding security and stability of the network that are being taken into account. Um, but the uh, discussion is still ongoing and decisions need to be made in the coming weeks and months on whether the first release, like the 2.0, will have all of this or whether we need more information and we will wait to see how this works on 2.0 and then make a decision for 2.1 and so on. All right, beautiful, thank you. Moving on to that. Question five, can we send staking rewards to an external wallet like we currently can? So in the in the very basic um, like in the, in the MVP of the proof of stake mechanism that we are implementing, uh, this is uh, not a possibility just yet. Uh, we can see that there there is some demand for it, so probably it will be considered. Um, by default, right now, uh, what we are implementing essentially restakes. All, uh, all the rewards. So if you stake a thousand wheat and you mine a block and you get uh, 250 wheat, those 250 wheat will 
be added to your staked balance um, automatically and you will able uh, you will be able to leverage that um, additional stake immediately but we yeah, yeah I understand that uh, some people uh, wants to they, they find it very convenient to have this automatic um, redirection of rewards towards their MyWood wallet or Sheka wallet and and yeah I, I, I think it's it's something that needs to be considered and taken into account uh, I don't know if for 2.0 or 2.1 as I'm saying uh, for, for a future release uh, because at the end of the day this is um, this is all about convenience and right now for me uh, my priority right now it's it's security right one step at a time uh, making sure that thing works first I, I agree that that's probably yeah. most <laughs> prioritize that first over anything else uh, how do I stake wit okay so I think um, this person asked it is a little bit uh, wasn't really uh, too sure about the actual transition, but I think it's a good opportunity to kind of talk about the uh, stakes tracker and the staking transactions along with the unstaking transactions that are uh, part of the 2.0. So essentially, um, staking is, is, is made, uh, when, when you want to stake, you will have to issue a staking transaction from your wallet. So we are planning for that to be a possibility from my wit wallet. You will have some button there, whatever, a menu where you can um, deposit your wit coins that will uh, go from your wallet to the node that will be actually doing the validation. Um, then unstaking works in a, in a similar way, uh, in the sense that you will be able to issue a transaction that essentially unstake uh, the amount that you uh, staked or a fraction of it and that will uh, withdraw those uh, rewards and that will um, go back to your to your wallet then there's one news there that is that we've when, when we were modeling this we realized that there could be some uh, situations that are not nice in which someone can accidentally or purposefully um, stake their coins into an address that they don't control and and that's scary both for whoever is losing control of their coins and also for whoever is running that the validator behind that address because they are essentially um, validating with someone else's coins, some some strangers coins without any authorization and so on, and that could be even a legal issue in some jurisdictions. So, um, what we uh, what we uh, figured out is uh, a very simple way to prevent that. So essentially. You have your validator node, you have your wallet, and you will take your validator node and you will um, actually like call one method from the, from the CLI of the node and that will issue an authorization message, which is like a, a code that you will need to introduce on your MyWid wallet or Sheka wallet. And uh, with that, you that wallet becomes authorized to stake uh, to that uh, to that node and so it's 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 the, the workflow exactly like like that you have your validator node you issue the authorization code you uh, put that in your wallet uh, you stake and, uh, and and that's it the next thing is that the stake uh, the staked coins of course they are no longer in your wallet although you can uh, withdraw them at any time but uh, it's not deposit deposited either in the node in the validator node in the sense that it cannot bend it because what what you do when you stake is saying hey this validator node I'm allowing them to operate to validate blocks and to witness and to do all this stuff with my coins that they cannot spend it. 
they cannot really um, so imagine that you have your validator node in some Amazon Web Services instance, uh, and someone hacks into that into that server. They cannot really take your money uh, because because the, the keys of that node are not the owners of that um, of those coins. The owner of those coins at all times will still be your your wallet from where you have um, staked. And, and that's the only one that will be able to withdraw and to spend. And uh, the only thing that the um, validator node can do is just operate with that, with those coins. So essentially uh, leverage the power that that stake gives it. And I also want to clarify one thing on that for the staking and the unstaking transactions that will require the network fees at the time, of course, right? Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. That makes sense. Uh, how will the supply characteristics change with the migration of proof of stake? So um, there, there are multiple options on the table right now. Um, there has been proposals for simply uh, changing the, uh, the halving period, short, like moving it. Um, sooner in time, uh, there have been proposals uh, exploring a more linear schedule. Um, there are many merits for all those different options. The one that sort of uh, I can s the, the one I can see the more the most the stronger support for. Uh, would probably be something in which um, we have a smooth transition to a, um, deep, to a fixed inflation model. So essentially, uh, the long-term goal would be for the issuance to be fixed when it comes to inflation. So it, it's not a fixed amount per year, but rather a fixed um, percentage per year, because it's me measured um, in, in inflation terms, so it's a percentage. And then um, the, um, the most important part of this is that as we are moving to proof of stake, and proof of, stare, uh, proof of stake requires um, higher incentivization, especially in the early days, but a non-negligible incentivization of the block mining uh, activity in the long term, we 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 cannot get rid of um, coin issuance completely a la Bitcoin in the style of Bitcoin anymore. With so, so the system that we have right now does the halvings very slowly over time, and uh, eventually at some point the mining rewards are um, not. So, like, block mining is not subsidized anymore, and the rewards that mining that miners get need to be collected from transactions, right? That's a Bitcoin model. And with proof of stake, that's probably not sustainable. There's um, abundant literature about it. And um, the thing is that as we are moving from a system that is alike, that is similar to proof of work, to a system that is purely proof of stake. Uh, there's there needs to be a transition like we cannot change the inflation from one day to another and change the rewards from one day to another which which is what the halvings do uh, because essentially you will have you can have a big percentage of the miners leaving the the validator game from one day to another because it's not profitable for them anymore so it needs to be a more progressive thing uh, that happens little by little. So what we are discussing is like um, the the mining rewards being recalculated every two weeks um, to to uh, basically um, try to target a specific inflation that changes over time and that it starts with the current inflation value and ends up being uh, like a, a base fixed inflation uh, over time. So 
imagine that right now we have like 15% inflation, so it will start with 15%, and then every two weeks it goes down and down and down and down and down and down until at some target point, uh, a couple of years uh, away in time or whatever, uh, it's a fixed amount of uh, something like um, 4%, 5%, whatever uh, we think it's uh, sustainable for, for proof of stake. That's um, essentially a system that I believe uh, works the best for the, for the facts of our ecosystem and for the type of miners uh, that we have and the validators that we will have. And essentially, it's, it's a system that uh, is quite balanced because it guarantees a smooth transition between uh, the Bitcoin model and a model that resembles more what Polkadot or Solana have uh, right now. All right, awesome. And uh, just Dr. CPU asked a question. The address to which the unstaked value will be sent is automatically the same as the address from which the staking address originated. Uh, if you want to jump in there. Yeah, short answer, yes, because the, um, the only address that we'll be able to withdraw or the address will the, where the rewards or whatever a value gets unstaked goes to uh, is decided upon staking. So when you stake, you that your wallet will actually put the unstaking uh, address in the in the transaction. It's like it will commit to withdraw the um, the rewards and so on to a particular address that it will be uh, that it will uh, generate at that point. Awesome. Uh, question eight here. Uh, what will the approximate APR be? I know who asked this and. Um I'm going to dox him, it's Dr. CPU. I was telling him that I was excited that uh, we didn't have any of these questions in this forum. And of course he did have to go and ask that. Um, so um, for shits and giggles, I guess we can see <laughs> if we can answer this, but I'm still not sure if we can yet. What will the approximate APR be? Oh. Uh, yeah, if you, I, I can, later I can maybe quote that on the Telegram chat or paste those messages into Discord or whatever. This has been discussed a couple of times on the uh, Telegram uh, channel. Um, so uh, Pete here uh, runs some numbers and he has a very nice spreadsheet where he uh, explores different scenarios. I also um, wrote some formulas there where you can essentially um, reproduce the same the same numbers uh, but essentially the APR is a function of the inflation um, so how you're essentially when, when you stake a certain amount you're staking an amount that is compared to the total amount that is staked so let's say that you are staking 10% of the network so your rewards will obviously be 10% of the inflation and that's it. <laughs> There's no mystery to it. There's no mystery to it. So right now, because the inflation is uh, rather high, uh, there's a big amount of wheat coins being freshly minted every year. Um, the, the rewards initially will be quite um, high, which is something to expect and something completely uh, desirable in a proof of stake, in a newly introduced proof of stake mechanism, because we want to attract a lot of uh, miners, new validators, and a lot of uh, new people to join this um, this community. And for doing so, obviously, uh, they will need uh, some weak coins to stake in the first place. All right, and uh, Petre just asked, "Are foundation and founders going to stake? Do you have any?" Um insight into that so that's that's a that's a great question um i'm not i'm not completely decided on that um i see i i buy i buy the arguments for and against that um ideally i mean yeah ideally if if the community itself puts enough percentage of the supply into the staking the foundation shouldn't need to 
but at the same time, I think it's a good idea that in the early days the foundation does stake at least some of uh, their coins with a view to having some base layer of security in the network and so that if, if, if someone tries to carry any kind of attack on the proof of stake mechanism while it's being bootstrapped uh, it becomes more costly for them essentially so right now that's more or less my take that for the sake of security and rising the bar of security and the cost of a theoretical attack it's probably a great idea that everyone who can stake their coins they go and do it that includes the foundation founders every holder you know the big guys like Arrington, Draper, whatever they should they really should it's in the in, in their best interest to do it <laughs> Right. Uh, question nine. I am not technical enough to run a node, but want to delegate my wit to a node. How will this be possible? And I think you kind of touched on that, uh, but it's another good opportunity to kind of um, see if we can delve a little bit more into it for those who might not be willing or able to run a node uh, in the early days. So if you, uh, yeah, for, for this kind of persona, um, there are in, ge in general, there, there, in every proof of stake mechanism, um, there are three mainly wa three main ways of uh, acting as a staker, um, sort of. One is to be a real validator, like you run your own node, uh, you deposit some stake there, you collect your own rewards. Period. Uh, that's the, that's what's implemented in the protocol. That's all about the that's the native staking mechanism of the protocol. On the other end, you have the guys that will stake in um, exchanges, for example. As I mentioned before, when you stake in exchange, you are not really uh, engaging with the staking protocol, with the protocol itself, with the network, with the staking transactions, uh, and you don't own the coins that are being staked. Because essentially what you are doing is depositing on some wallet of the of the exchange and you are giving them your coins and they will add those coins to their existing stake, they will become more powerful and they are promising a share of their rewards. That's exactly how it works. But then, uh, um, yeah, um, of course we expect um, exchanges to support um, staking of wheat coins uh, that's something that that we can completely expect and to the extent possible uh, we will facilitate all the documentation and all the integration guides for that to to happen as soon as possible because it's it's a very interesting opportunity and a very easy way to onboard um, non-technical people into the pro into the project and into our ecosystem but then there's also uh, an option uh, somewhat in the middle with the protocol with the staking protocol that i outlined before which is that essentially if you have coins on your wallet on your winnet wallet and your my wallet, wallet whatever and uh, and you can ha and you want to actually have more control uh, you can have someone else uh, run a node for you and they will um, they will run the node they will issue the authorization code you will put that authorization code onto your wallet you stake they cannot do shit with your coins they cannot really steal your your coins what they can obviously do is just turn off the, the the server and and forced slashing on your coins that's something unavoidable but that's rather a model that you do on so, uh, with someone who you trust uh, either someone who you trust because it's your friend like uh, you have one uh, you have your friend run a node for you and you stake your coins to their node that's perfectly fine 
that that can be done. Uh, and the other case in which this can also happen is that, well, I could imagine someone who does this as a service, maybe, uh, like, um, yeah, uh, validators as a service, which is quite a thing in other um, in other networks, and there are yeah there are companies that that do that, and that's uh, with this same model uh, that's perfectly allowed. So it's not like you're delegating your your coins, but rather uh, have someone else run the infrastructure for you, and you will um, stake onto the address uh, of that node that is being maintained by a third party, be it your friend or a company. That's a great answer. Um, is there a roadmap planning for proof of stake migration? I think we could probably skip this one because we actually did uh, cover it um, prior yeah, to we, this. We covered, we covered the roadmap. The only thing I want to circle on is that there, once once everything is ready to go live with with uh, with proof of stake and 2.0, 2. Uh, I want people to, to, to have this idea clear in mind. There will be a period in which the network has decided to go full 2.0, but the new protocol will not be enforced yet. And that period will be at least one month in which people will be able to stake that and uh, there will be no that, that stake will not uh, be used to uh, decide which nodes um, can validate blocks. The the, the old protocol will still be honored, and um, and there is another requirement for uh, going to point for for the activation of proof of stake, which is that the total amount of coins staked is above a, th a certain threshold, something like 200 million, 300 million, is yet to be decided. Uh, so that the initial uh, incentives and the initial security of the network uh, actually lives up to the expectations of security uh, that the um, current users of the network uh, have. Because this will be a zero down downtime transition. So uh, there will be no merge or anything like that. It's just the the, the nodes changing their behavior from version 1.6 to version 2 of the protocol from one moment to another. Once those requirements are are met, that there is enough um, coins staked and that there has been at least one month for people to uh, to stake their their coins. What, what this means. Uh, to the uh, utility of the network which is acting as an oracle is that the uh, imagine the contracts on Ethereum, mainnet, on uh, Polygon, whatever, they will not notice any change. They will continue upgrading their price feeds and everything as usual, but from one moment to another their uh, requests will be resolved by a improved um, version of the protocol that has different security properties. That's why we want to make sure that from moment zero, uh, those data requests are protected by the utmost uh, level of security. And uh, after discussing it um, here on Discord uh, for 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 a long time, uh, we 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 saw that something like setting the threshold on 200, 300. Um, a thousand million uh, width will be probably uh, enough and not delay the activation of the 2.0 uh, and the proof of stake mechanism for too long. Because if we set it too high, the risk is obviously that people uh, will uh, be lazy and not 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 stake enough coins, and uh, proof of stake would essentially be delayed. Uh, and and we don't want. <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, uh, proof of stake should enter into force exactly one month after the TAPI, um, the TAPI me uh, mechanism um, shows that um, that there's enough support for for 2.0. So essentially, that 80% of the network has upgraded. Awesome, uh, and we're gonna see if we can do a segue here. Uh, Petre asked, 
With switching to POS, are you planning to invest in marketing exchanges, better liquidity, and simple with more advanced tech? Are you going to improve other sides of the project? Uh, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, we have a few things in the works right now. Uh, I'm not too sure how in-depth we want to go on that, so I will uh, revert to a Don, but um, the short answer is, is we, have, we have some stuff in the works. Yeah, uh, 2.0 is not only proof of stake, uh, there's only the, the new economics and so on. There's, uh, I see 2.0 as a new stage for the protocol as a whole, uh, for, the, for the project, sorry. Uh, the, and, and my long-term view is that uh, WinNet is not only the WinNet network that we know right now and the Oracle that we know right now. Uh, we have uh, some. We have a clear mission. Uh, we have a clear vision as well. And uh, and right now we believe that the best uh, place we can devote our efforts is in um, in this effort for improving the security and the economics of the WinNet Oracle and the WinNet network. But there could be much more coming in the future. So in this new stage, in this new 2.0 stage, there are many things that are changing. It's not only the protocol. And this is something that I want to make it very clear. And, uh, and yeah, of course, of course, there are marketing efforts being planned for maximizing the impact that the transition has and how and how we capture the attention of potential uh, node um, node operators potential validators and the stakers uh, because they they will have a lot more opportunities now like uh, mining mining with net before or mining with with right now it's it's funny it's interesting that uh, with 2.0, it's going to be a huge opportunity for them because it's a much more straightforward mechanism because it's uh, a pure staking mechanism that they are familiar with and that will be very convenient for them. And I'm very confident that we will be able uh, to onboard a much broader um, community of, of stakers. And then there, there's also a lot of uh, different stuff that is changing, uh, ranging from, yeah, I don't know, like branding. Uh, like we are undergoing a, a full rebranding of the WinNet brand uh, to make more clear uh, communication, to more clearly state uh, that WinNet is, is a, a next generation oracle that is here to change completely how smart contracts are secured and how DeFi protocols are secured and also to highlight uh, the powerful nature of the WinNet Oracle, especially of the 2.0 version as it will enable a uh, number of, of use cases and, and uh, give uh, smart contract developers and, and protocols um, a lot of new opportunities to create valuable staff and to be uh, part of the next uh, generation of um, of crypto of, of crypto stuff, you know. Very well said. Thank you. Uh, moving on here to oops, sorry. Question eleven: Being the first proof of stake oracle, do you expect a lot of interest from larger companies in the crypto space? And could this be something that would make Wit a choice over Link? Very excited to hear this answer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I know I ran away from saying it's it's a proof of stake oracle, but uh, yeah, you could argue uh, with that with 2.0, uh, WinNet is becoming a proof of stake oracle, but um, because um, because proof of stake and oracle are words that can mean different things for for different people. I don't know exactly what forms in the mind of the people when I say proof of stake oracle, but yeah, it's certainly something that that sounds appealing, and I can see that uh, narrative uh, driving significant attention towards uh, towards this project, and um, and a lot and yeah and, and, and letting allowing us to reach um, crypto people that we haven't been able to reach before. Because our um, our system maybe felt too alien for them, to uh, custom made or whatever, 
and with with um, with with a predictable proof of stake mechanism in which you can actually have APR numbers shown there, they will be able to simply assess whether they go and in five minutes stake their coins or or, or, or whether it's a pass, right? So so yeah, I think with as a coin it's becoming much more attractive. Um, and um, and in the same sense that I was saying that uh, this is a huge opportunity for um, for those stakers uh, to to yeah to get some rewards in a um, way easier way than 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 it is today. It's also a huge opportunity for them to contribute to the security of the oracle, and that translate to. Uh, contributing to the security of the smart contracts that are relying on the Oracle. And that means secure, like helping secure crypto, helping secure Web3. So as a staker in Witnet 2.0, you are not only earning some rewards, you are also, uh, yeah, you are, you are essentially being part of making crypto a better place. <laughs> All right, uh, and we got a question here by T. Where can we find staking information? Are there levels? Um, not too sure what he means by levels, uh, so maybe we can give him some time to clarify and we'll move on to question 12. Uh, you say with WIT and 2.0, exchanges will be incentivized to list the WIT token, given that, WIT, WIT coin, excuse me, given that staking and tokenomics are fundamental aspects of their business models. How do you plan to attract these exchanges to list and stake WIT? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting, a very interesting question. So, uh, as I mentioned before, we are planning for uh, having very clear documentation and integration guides for uh, facilitating um, them to to create or to integrate with the Bitcoin into their existing staking um, staking as a service mechanism or whatever they 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 call it. Um, it's uh, of course, uh, there like there's no need to. I mean, like, uh, yeah, they, they will be naturally incentivized because people uh, prefer to stake their coins that we have in their in sitting in the exchange uh, doing nothing or in their wallets uh, doing nothing, and and we know for certain that there's uh, a huge percentage of uh, people in crypto who who never move their coins from from the exchanges. So um, the best thing that they can do, obviously, is, is to stake them, and 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 yeah, the, the incentive is, is there for the for the exchanges to allow for that and for to somehow push their uh, users to put their coins into uh, into the best use because that essentially will allow the exchanges to have uh, more power in the network, which translates to more rewards, which uh, translate to income for them. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, the, the, for on one side, there are efforts being done to make it as easy as possible for this to be a possibility, and uh, and writing those guides, uh, those, that documentation, and so on, and then uh, there are ongoing discussions with the exchanges um, themselves to help them uh, understand how to how to do this. Like it's not something that we can unilaterally force on them. It's like uh, what we need to do is obviously make them understand um, the attractive of this, and then uh, they will they will go and do it. Awesome, thank you. Um, will it still be possible to run a node on a Raspberry Pi? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, for sh for for sure. Yeah, yeah. The one one big um, design decision, sort of, or yeah, when when going on to designing how 2.0 would look like, one requirement was not to change drastically the. Um, the hardware requirements of running a node, uh, which uh, are obviously 
very important for the people who want uh, to run a validator operation at a certain scale and also for also allowing hobbyists and the amateur staker to to be a part of this and yeah we haven't changed that and the new version of the software should should, uh, should work on the same uh, commodity hardware that the current version does and during the transition period uh, the requirements will still be the same as before and after the transition period and with proof of stake into place actually the requirements uh, should be lower after we make a 2.0.1 release in which we remove uh, all the old stuff and we get rid of that overhead of uh, the node having to decide whether to apply the the, the former logic or the 2.0 logic but, but yeah uh, in the in in our road to 2.0 we are refactoring some pieces of the software we are improving a number of pieces so chances are that as i'm saying probably the 2.0 release um, will have a smaller footprint and, and a smaller requirements than, than, the, than the current one does awesome okay and um yeah dr cpu has a, a great point there because uh, with 2.0, uh, one, one of the things that related to the coin issuance thing and so on, uh, we will have shorter blocks. Uh, this is something that I, I almost forget, forget to mention. Uh, that uh, accidentally sort of reduces the memory requirements because you don't need to accumulate so uh, so many transactions in the mempool you don't need to accumulate a lot of stuff uh, and stuff in, in memory because with shorter blocks uh because uh, you essentially wipe off all that cached information uh more often and it's written to to this more often uh so actually the ram the memory footprint should be smaller <laughs> that's uh that's a nice point Cool, and uh, T asked, I think we kind of covered this, but he said he was a little late, so maybe we can go over it real quick for him. When I want to run nodes, should I wait for a transition to complete, or can I do that already? What's, what's the question again? Uh, when I want to run a node, should I wait for the transition to complete, or can I do that already? And I think this is kind of an yeah, interesting you can, answer. You, you can do it already, deposit some coins there, start playing with the... With the uh, yeah, with the current protocol, earn some weeds, uh, hopefully, so that you have some to to deposit on the 2.0 version. Then, um, then for the for the 2.0 transition, as soon as the 2.0 release is released, uh, we will um, encourage urge everyone in the ecosystem to update to the 2.0 version. And as they go and upgrade their nodes. They will see almost no change because the node will still be uh, running the old version of the of the protocol. But um, but the the tappy thing uh, will engage and will uh, essentially the the, the blocks the, sorry the, the miners will start to signal that uh, they are ready for the 2.0 uh, transition uh, through a special flag in the in the block um, in the block headers. That's how uh, the tappy mechanism works. And um, and yeah yeah I'm, I I I would if I were uh, coming as a newcomer uh, to to the Winnet ecosystem right now I I would totally um, get familiar with with the current protocol because the new one will um, will be not that different from a node operator perspective it will only get easier uh, to to stake and and more attractive of course. And um, yeah, and that, that's it. Yeah, it's a great idea to start uh, today, and then when when the time comes to upgrade, uh, you will have a clear tutorial on on how to do it, and it's it will be no different uh, from uh, how it is done right now. Like every time you uh, you need to upgrade your node to make sure that you are running the last version with the latest security fixes and so on. 
Alrighty, and uh, now on to the final question of the uh, presentation. Um, how is this affecting your partnership with Reef Chain? And actually, I think it's a good opportunity to um, talk about how it will affect our partnerships with uh, everyone in general, but I believe the one who asked this is from the Reef community, uh, who we have a good relationship with. So um, I think there's a lot of answers here. and. Um, it kind of goes into that uh, mar marketing and uh, listings kind of discussion, but I think it's a great uh, opportunity to talk about how our partners might uh, see the protocol after the change. Oh, I, I, I thought you were, <laughs> you were oh. answering the question. You oh, no, not yet. <laughs> I was going to see what you said first. So yeah, from uh, because the the you know that from, from the early days the, the Witnet Oracle was designed to run as a completely um, standalone thing inside the Witnet network, and then to have bridges to different uh, blockchains, and those bridges simply do some message passing between one chain and another. They rely the the Oracle queries and their responses. Um, there, there's a lot, a huge degree of abstraction there, and um, and yeah, these integrations will be completely unaffected by by this um, by this transition. Uh, what uh, what the, the the best like the biggest impact that we will have is that. We will take this opportunity to reconnect with these projects and to try to get them on board in some way or another, to do cross marketing, to amplify the message that Witnet is becoming a big thing. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it's a great it's it's a great um, because we have this relationship with them. Like for example, with Reef, um, we have we have a strong partnership. Um, it's a it's a great opportunity for them to double down in our ecosystem and also for us uh, to capture um, the the attention of the people in their ecosystem. Essentially, try to get their community to become our community. <laughs> right, and uh, something I kind of wanted to touch on was that uh, the idea that. Uh, something that always seemed interesting to me was, um, you know, interacting with these partners and telling them that by simply holding uh, the Bitcoin, it's in the hands of honest people. And even if you don't stake it, you're still supporting your network by holding the Bitcoin. Because the more wit that's in the honest hands, the h harder it is to uh, manipulate the protocol. And I think that's kind of an interesting um, way we can go about uh, strengthening strengthening our partnerships with uh, chains and protocols that Witnet is live on because obviously if Witnet wins, everybody wins. Yeah, I guess you have a point there. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the, the more coins are out of the market, the, the better for the protocol security. That's completely out of out of question and that's even the under the, like the bottom line of a proof of stake mechanism you're saying these coins are here locked uh, for the contributing to the security of the network and uh, if someone wants to come and challenge that and break the security they will probably need an amount of coins uh, that is not available in the market right exactly yeah 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 the ideal scenario this is this is exactly like that if you if we have more than half of the supply staked in the protocol you cannot break it but uh, the history has that and history shows that people are lazy people are in crypto for different reasons a lot of coins are sitting in wallets not moving for decades um, I, and yeah if you look at things like um, yeah, I don't know, Kleros, for example, Kleros Protocol or whatever, um, or Argon or, you know, these, these, these uh, protocols that focus a lot on governance and so on, you can see that even if the tokens have a huge power to make decisions and to govern the, the network and the protocol, most of, the, most of them are not used 
and protocols that have uh, proper staking mechanisms, it's surprising that many of them, the, um, the percentage of tokens that are staked uh, is rather small, and it's quite far away from the 50% uh, threshold that is the idea. Um, there are probably many things we can, we can do about that. Um, that's, that's why we have this threshold for the activation of proof of stake, because we want to make sure that we get as close to the 50% as possible, or, or at least we, we are in the same dimension, sort of. Uh, but then there, there can be yeah, a lot of that we can do on the marketing side and so on to, to drive coins towards being staked. And, and then for future versions, maybe we can think of fancy stuff like Polkadot has. Like, for example, in Polkadot, the amount of co new coins being issued is uh, proportional to that percentage. So they have a target percentage of 70%, and if, for example, only 35% of the coins are staked, the rewards are half of what they can be. So it's on everyone's interest to grow the total amount of coins being staked so that uh, more coins are created and distributed among validators. It's a, it's a very interesting model, uh, one that um, we are closely monitoring and seeing how it plays out and who benefits. Uh, because maybe in the future um, we we would be looking forward to, to implement something like that. For now, um, our take is that uh, the the simpler and the most straightforward we can make the protocol and with less variables, the better. And then we can iterate on that and, and build on that. Great. Awesome. And I want to thank you, uh, Adon, for your time and everybody who joined us. That's That concludes the uh, proof of stake presentation. I hope you guys learned a lot about uh, what's to come in the next few months. And uh, I think hopefully you guys had a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I just want to thank you all for, for, uh, for joining us. And uh, if anybody has anything they want to add, please feel free to do so now. But we're starting to run up on uh, an hour and a half. So uh, I want to get you guys out of here if you got other stuff to do, because I know it's late elsewhere in the world. Thank you for hosting, Ben. Thank you for everyone for, for attending. Uh, those were very interesting questions. Uh, and uh, it was great to have the opportunity to explain a lot of different stuff that has been discussed here and there. But probably for many people in the community, uh, they were not that clear. Uh, we are doing all our best uh, to, to explain all of this and to produce all the documentation and medium articles and everything uh, for everyone to be um, aware of all of this and on the same page. And yeah, everything is uh, looking very good for a successful 2.0 transition in the coming months. And yeah, we're really um, excited about it and we count on everyone uh, in this com community's uh, support. Thank you. Yeah, very well said. Thank you, everyone. And um, without further ado, I think we'll end this here and uh, jump off. And we'll talk to you guys in the Telegram and the Discord. If you have any questions, please let us know. And as long as this recording worked out uh, the way I expected it to, it will be up on YouTube if you missed anything. Thank you all, and I'll uh, talk to you soon.